Hey, it's Professor Wham. I'm recording this on what in the United States is called Mother's Day. And I'm doing this today because I don't have anything else to do. I don't really celebrate Mother's Day for a variety of reasons. Um, so anyway, I already talked about a little bit about this case, the Albert K. Bender case in an earlier an earlier blog um, the the men in black blog as it were and so at that time i said that i would do something a little bit more specific on albert k bender because his case is really interesting in some ways um, it's rather confusing and uh, you know, as I reread the book that he wrote describing his experiences, there were just, I just got further and further down into these various weird rabbit holes. And so um, I thought what I would do is talk a little bit about the book and share some of the rabbit holes and just kind of demonstrate how how strange it is that such an odd story could have been so influential, although I doubt that in and of itself it would have been influential if it were not for other players, you know, people like Gray Barker, etc. But anyway, Albert Bender himself, uh, he was born in 1921. Um, he came from a, a kind of a regular family, a, a, a regular sort of working class to a lower middle class family. At the time of the experiences uh, that he talks about in his book, he lived in Bridgeport, Connecticut and had been living there for some time. Um, I believe he'd been living there since after he'd come home from service in World War II. He, you know, he was a vet and he lived uh, in a house in Bridgeport, Connecticut. For those of you who are aware of UFO and other paranormal kind of hot spots in the Northeast, Bridgeport, Connecticut is known to be sort of a paranormal um, hot spot. Uh, and he talks a little bit about that in his book, um, as well as gives a little bit of information about his family. Um, his family doesn't play a huge role in his story. Uh, but then he seems to be a very private person in a lot of ways. Um, but he does report in his book, at least, um, when he did tell his story, that his family um, had reported a number of paranormal experiences that had happened to them, um, a number of interesting haunting experiences, ghost experiences, experiences with changes of consciousness and presence and things like that. So um, he was aware of those kinds of reports. And indeed, this kind of goes with what we know about him, um, the way he describes himself uh, in his book, uh, that he was an individual who we would kind of uh, call sort of a geek, you know, sort of a a, a D and D kind of guy, uh, somebody who um, liked monster movies, liked science fiction. Uh, he was sort of a prankster, apparently. He um, liked to play practical jokes on his friends, although uh, not mean ones. Uh, but he had a, a bevy of friends, people that would come over and, and they would hang out together. Uh, he, he appar And he was, as I, as I wrote it in my script, he had sort of a... Um, he had sort of a... a tendency to, he had sort of a tendency to want to impress his friends in some way um, he, as part of this pra practical joke, uh, these practical jokes that he would play. So that, for example, um, one of the things he would do is, or one of the things that he did was he painted um, and drew pictures uh, all over his his walls. He lived in the attic, not the attic, but in like an extra room that was in the upper part of his house with his stepfather. And uh, he would he would 
paint these pictures of, of like monsters and monstrous faces and masks and stuff and kind of do little haunted house things where his his friends would bring their girlfriends and they would sort of, uh, you know, scare them, watch scary movies and scare them. He, he sort of believed in the, or, or adhered to what I call the bump in the night version of occultism, sort of generally, although it doesn't look like he really, like sincerely practiced anything specifically. But in any case, and these are all things that he talks about or how he describes himself in his book, but his friends apparently knew this about him. Um, so kind of what the, the regular world knew about him was that he was a guy who was interested in UFOs. He had collected apparently quite a collection of, of uh, news clippings. Um, in his book, he talks about how he remembers when the term flying saucers first came to be applied to these things flying around. Uh, he remembered the Arnold sighting, the Kenneth Arnold sighting specifically. Um, and so he had those kinds of interests. And so all that the public really knew about him at first was that uh, he had gotten together with some friends um, in 1952. And they had decided that they would form an organization that they called the International Flying Saucers Bureau, uh, which apparently turns out to have been the first sort of international large-scale uh, civilian UFO investigatory uh, body. Um, and he decided that uh, they, they decided that they would create a, 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 an organization that was like would be like a clearinghouse for UFO reports. Um, for, for a membership fee, they would publish a newsletter quarterly in which uh, they would solicit articles from well-known individuals who were, you know, writing in the UFO milieu at the time, and and it would be presented this way. And so basically. He and his buddies took some time, took two or three months to organize this. Um, they got together what we would now call a contact list and a media kit, and they sent this stuff out. And it, according to him, it was a hit. Uh, there were lots of people who were very interested, and at a certain point, um, he, uh, they, they had all kinds of people that were uh, associated that were members of this group, you know, including people like Frank Scully and James Mosley was associated at one point, and um, they even got letters from Georgia Damsky, and of course, among all the different people who were interested was Gray Barker, uh, and Gray Barker became a member. He was not a, an official, officiating member, you know, like an official member of the kind of central CEO committee that ran this uh, that ran, that made the decisions, the financial decisions, but he was certainly present there um, and, d you know, did his own investigations and made his own contributions. They, you know, eventually they had to create a, a, uh, a bank account to put the membership money into because uh, they were having so many memberships come in. There were people that, you know, membership requests were coming in from the UK and from Australia Eventually, what they had to do was they had to uh, kind of give leave to people in the UK and in Australia to kind of start their own chapters because um, it became apparent that it was too difficult to process the currency of those two countries in the United States. You have to remember, this is after World War II. Um, the UK in particular is still under the Marshall Plan. So uh, their currency was very unstable. So it was very, very difficult to, uh, to do those kinds of uh, membership um, currency transfers. So what they did was they just said, listen, you guys, start your own branches. And each branch did really well. And there were all kinds of really interesting um, uh, reports that were coming in from all these different places. Um, and then what it seemed like on the outside was all of a sudden, about a year into this, a little over a year into this, um, in 1953, uh, Albert Bender suddenly declares to 
the official members, the officials of of the of the International um, Flying Saucers Bureau, that he has to shut this down. That this and it's very sudden. Apparently, he has to shut this down. That he's gotten information about the flying saucers um, that he can't share. He has to shut it down. Um, but he wants to send out um, a notice to paying members about this and have like one last newsletter issue. So the rest of the the rest of the um, organization is really confused about this. But he goes ahead and does this. He returns all of the money, um, the unused money that people had had sent in for subscription, and he shutters it, and that was it. He just closed it down. Now, obviously, behind the scenes, there was more going on. And one of his friends, and people wanted to know, like, you know, what the hell happened? And, and of course, rumors just ran riot, you know. Um, anything for, you know, the, 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 the less generous people accusing Bender of having taken money and running, which, of course, he did not do. He actually was very meticulous, apparently, in returning money. Um, but apparently what was weird to some of his friends was that he even refused to really talk about what had happened. Um, now, it did so happen that during the, the year of when the Bureau was running, he had actually met a woman named Betty who came from the UK office of the Bureau, um, and the two had fallen in love, and he was in the process of getting married. So there were some people that thought that maybe he was more interested in that now than in doing this sort of what was seen as sort of a guy thing, even though she had come to him through the Bureau um, mirroring his interests in UFOs. So that w it wasn't clear that that would have been it either, that she, she would have said anything about that. And, and, he, and in his later work, he doesn't claim that at all. In fact, he, he uh, dismisses the idea that that was, that that was a reason. Um, and Gray Barker apparently wouldn't let it go. And so constantly sort of poked at him to try to get what he could out of him. And apparently Bender would give him little bits and pieces, which eventually in 1956... Um, Gray Barker wrapped up into a book, which he called They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers. And so you can kind of think of this Gray Barker book, which I have read. Um, I don't have the original. That's the original um, cover right there. But you can kind of see where this is headed. It's, it's really in this book that the idea of the men in black or these mysterious guys uh, sort of begin, it begins, it begins its, its, its track as a meme producer, if you want to put it that way. Um, but Bender himself wouldn't, still wouldn't say anything. He said that he couldn't. And so finally, in 1962, or 1961, the end thereof, Bender finally told Barker that he would be able to tell his side of the story, or the whole story, the rest of the story, as it were. So Barker says, okay, I'll publish it. And Bender said, okay. And so um, in 1962, this book was released, um, Flying Saucers and the Three Men. And so this is Bender's account of what happened to him. Um, now, Barker had dark, hinted darkly that shadowy government forces were somehow responsible for Bender giving up his pursuit of the flying saucer mystery. Um, but the story that Bender's going to tell is a little bit different. Um, and, of course, the book was immediately controversial. So for Bender's part, he did very little public events surrounding the book's release. He avoided the media as much as possible. In fact, really whatever media existed um, surrounding this book was done by Barker. Um, 
And soon after the book was published, after, I don't know, like maybe one or two, you know, a very few public events, uh, Bender left the public stage permanently and lived a relatively bland and normal life, apparently happily married until his death in 2016. He eventually ended up becoming the manager of a large motel in California. <laughs> you know, I mean, completely divorced from all of this stuff. Um, so this particular... Um, and to my knowledge, at least, he refused to discuss his experiences recounted in the book and went on to other interests. Um, so in 2014, this edition of Flying Saucers and the Three Men was republished by New Cesarian Press in 2014. I was finally able to get a copy. I can't, I was not able to get an original edition of it and read it for myself. I'd heard, of course, many things about it at the time, but I had never read it. So what I have to say is that it is a very strange tale, and yet it remains absolutely essential to understanding aspects of the social meme that developed around the idea of the men in black. Um, if you want another, a different summary of this book, um, a few years ago, when this um, journal was still publishing, and that's the Borderland, the, the Journal of Borderland Science, um, a paranormal investigator, Riley Crabb, put together an incomplete critical summary of this book, um, along with some of his ideas about what might be going on in it. And here is um, the, the website of this article. It's actually a series of articles. And it gives, uh, at the very start here, part one through four, it does give sort of a, you know, a, a table of contents, essentially, about, about the, uh, and his analysis of what's going on of the book. Um, so I'm not going to do a blow-by-blow -blow kind of rendition of it, because you can find this online, and I'll provide the link for it. Um, and, uh, but you'll find it interesting. I don't necessarily agree with everything that Crabb says, but, you know, it is, he does have some valuable insights. Um, so first in the book is Riley's description, ben uh, Riley, Bender's description of himself, and I've already talked about that a little bit, um, as a prankster, kind of a geeky guy, um, obsessed with monster movies and science fiction, etc., um, it talks about his reported experiences um, in, his, in his family, some paranormal experiences. Um, Bender does talk about um, where he was introduced to the idea of UFOs or flying saucers. Um, he was introduced to them basically through newspaper reports that he started reading and assembling while he was still in the military um, and in, through the writings of Charles Fort. So Charles Fort, um, he reports, was a formative in, of, of influence on him and his approach. Um, so long story short, um, as I've already discussed, um, he and a couple of friends decided to start this UFO group, um, and th it was very successful. I forgot to mention that Mead Lane was also a member of this group and had talked you know, had, had shared with the group and with Bender in particular some of the psychic elements that seemed to be part of the, uh, the experience of UFOs. Uh, and apparently Bender was somewhat interested in this because of how he approached this later, and you'll, you'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, now, as Bender tells his story in the book, there were some strange precursors to the reported events that he talks about um, that, that ended up giving him uh, the impetus to, change, to, to give up his research. There was an FBI agent who showed interest in an interview, although the FBI agent also said that he was just sort of checking things out. Um, and Bender also reports that in the months leading up to his um, his odd experiences beginning, there were strange bout, bouts of dizziness, headaches, 
and seeming changes of consciousness, as well as an odd blue light that would periodically shine underneath the door of unused rooms in the attic where he lived. He also reports seeing an odd person staring at him in a, in a uh, movie theater. So, you know, all of this sort of acts from a narrative standpoint um, as kind of a sent, uh, as kind of foreboding. He also reports that there were some strange things that happened at the headquarters of the Australian branch of the Bureau that seemed to accompany their investigation of a flap that was going on down there. There were several reports of strange men in vehicles surveilling uh, the headquarters of the Australian Bureau um, from like 3 a.m. to sunrise. Now, obviously, there was a question in everyone's mind at, in Australia about the strange men and the surveillance um, that were connected to the UFO inquiry, the details of which were being discussed in the organization's newsletter. Now, by his own account, Bender ended up being partially the cause of the first initial instance of dissension in the Bureau. He and a number of Bureau officials wanted to hold what they called a World Contact Day, an exercise in which all international members who wanted to participate would meditate and send a telepathic message at the same time, you know, once adjusted for time zones, on March 15, 1953, at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And again, obviously adjusted for time zones. And when I told this to a friend, he was like, oh, the Ides of March. <laughs> and I was like, well, you know, I don't, you know, I don't know if that's the case or not. Now, there were, uh, the members who wanted to do this, following Bender's lead, would send a message that would start out this way. So it's a fairly lengthy telepathic message, but this is sort of part of what it says. It's, quote, calling occupants of interplanetary craft, calling occupants of interplanetary craft that have been observing planet Earth, we of IFSB wish to make contact with you. We are your friends and would like you to make an appearance on Earth. Please come in peace and help us with our earthly problems. Give us some sign that you have received our message. Be responsible for creating a miracle here on our planet to wake up the ignorant ones to reality. Unquote. I'm, I'm condensing it. And each sender was to repeat this three times. Now, here's where we get off into, a, into a, a caveat here, all right? I'm sure some of you will recognize immediately that this plea or prayer or invocation, such as you would like to put it, is the basis for the lyrics of the 70s song that was first recorded by the band Klaatu and then was later covered by the Carpenters in 1978, Calling Occupants of Interplanetary Craft is the name of the song. Um, and, and both versions, but especially the Carpenter's version, enjoyed a strange notoriety because the latter version is actually well-produced, expertly performed, as only the Carpenter's could do it, and was quite a meme dropper, given its release during the same time period as the blockbuster film Close Encounters of the Third Kind, which was released a year earlier, 1977. Now, what you have to keep in mind here in terms of popular and alternative culture is this is the same time period in which um, the group that was begun by, you know, Bo and Peep, Marshall Applewhite and, and Bonnie Lou, um, or Tweedle and Dumb, as they sometimes called themselves, the group that later became Heaven's Gate, um, and committed mass suicide in 19, 1997. This time period was exactly the time period when their group first started or first gained a kind of public notoriety um, and is talked about at length in um, Jacques Vallée's book, Messengers of Deception, which, which came out at approximately the same time. We sometimes forget that the mid and late 70s are basically a gold mine of kind of neo-extraterrestrial inspired materials um, from the publishing of J.J. Hertog's Book of Knowledge, Keys of Enoch, 
um, the rising popularity of books by Buckminster Fuller, who had been writing since the late 60s, but achieved a kind of new um, publicity in the late 70s, as well as the wide publication of the Seth material, which really began to hit the mainstream in the late 70s. Um, there are a number of other uh, kind of popular songs like I think of, I mean, of course, I grew, I, I came of age in the 70s, so I think of, you know, Come Sail Away by Journey, uh, which was a, a top uh, a 40s hit and is actually based on an actual UFO sighting, an experience that the lyricist, the, 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 the lead singer experienced. There was also a song that was released in 1979, Children of the Sun by Billy Thorpe, which is, which is kind of a, is, is both a, 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 um, a kind of anthem to extraterrestrials generally, but is also based on, a, on one of the legends of the Inca nobility, uh, where they tie uh, the origins of their, of their progeny or their ancestry to extraterrestrials very specifically. And even the Patti Smith song, Birds, which was released in 1975 on her classic debut album, Horses, is based on the autobiographical account of Wilhelm Reich's obsession with UFOs as parasitical entities and is detailed in his book, Peter Reich, in the excellent book, A Book of Dreams, which if you haven't read A Book of Dreams and you like, you like you're interested in the works of Reich, it's written by his son, and it's an autobiography. Um, and this book further inspired Kate Bush's hit song, Cloud Busting. So you see there's all of these different meme-ish things happening at the same time. And then and, and another example I thought of was, the, was in 1981, Blue Oyster Cult released a, a single that I think it did make the top 40. It, it didn't go much down into this, but it's... Um, it's the um, from the album of the same name, and the and the title of the song is "Fire of Unknown Origin," which is another which is based on a Patti Smith lyric. She actually sings backup in this song, uh, and and it's about UFO experiences essentially and abductions. It's about abductions. Um, so as and for further digging, of course, uh, for memesters who like cultural archaeology, of course, you will know that the name Klaatu comes from the 1951 film, which Bender had to have seen and know about, uh, the day the Earth stood still, um, and it might even, in fact, be the basis for the the invocation that he gave, uh, the plea for a world miracle, because that's kind of what. Uh, that movie is about. It's about human beings needing to um, shape up. Otherwise, we're going to become a burnt crisp, as it were. Um, so in the film, Klaatu, who is an extraterrestrial, um, comes to Earth. He's protected by a robot named Gort, who is a robot, robotic policeman, a security guard, and an enforcer. Um, and they come to Earth in order to warn humanity to change our violent ways, or we will never be permitted to venture into space, and in fact will be destroyed. And to, in order to demonstrate his power, Klaatu stops all electricity across the planet, except in places where to do so would endanger life. This is interpreted as an act of war, and Klaatu is shot by American, of course, military forces and killed. Gort rescues Klaatu's body and brings him back to life. Uh, the main human woman protagonist, who has of course fallen in love with an alien, only survives being killed by Gort herself by uttering the words Klaatu Barata Nikto, a formula that Klaatu had given to her to use if anything happened to her to him. Now, some people will recognize the formula, Klaatu Barata Nikto, as the invocation that the character Ash Williams uses to subdue the evil magic of the Necronomicon in the Evil Dead franchise, uh, the third movie of that franchise, Army of Darkness, which is probably the place where most people first encountered the name Klaatu. Um, 
And as an even further sort of foray into weirdness, others will recognize the, the basic plot line of The Day the Earth Stood Still from the song um, uh, Science Fiction Double Feature in the Rocky Horror Picture Show that references Michael Rennie, who played Klaatu, in the original movie. And of course, the movie was remade in 2008, starting Keanu Reeves. So this is just like the tip of the iceberg of all of the weird places you can go just from looking at all the connections to this book. And of course, uh, you know, Gray Barker could put it down, and he wrote like three other books. Uh, the last one, I think, in the 80s, uh, detailing his own sort of at, ways of looking at the men in black and the influence of, of, Al, of Al Bender's story on American culture generally. Now, bringing us back to Bender, it's not known who actually wrote this plea for contact. Um, two of the most important officials in the Bureau design, resigned in disgust and would have nothing to do with this telepathic attempt to reach extraterrestrials. Um, and, and they did this before this was even attempted. In any case, enough of the leadership and membership regarded the attempt positively that Bender went ahead and tried it on the aforesaid date and time. Now, apparently, that's all it took. Again, long story short, Bender describes an almost immediate effect to this telepathic attempt. He saw flashing blue lights along with the smell of rotten eggs, which he had been smelling off and on for a little while. And he felt like he was floating, almost like an out-of-body experience. His temples started to throb ter terribly, and he heard a voice tell him that he was going to be given future messages, that he had been chosen for contact, but that was just the beginning. According to him in the book, over the course of several months, Three men or beings would appear in Bender's living quarters to warn him against continuing his investigations. They looked vaguely like humans, except that their eyes glowed, and they seemed to float above the ground. They did seem to wear these hats, and when they became more visible physically, they looked like they were wearing suits with Hamburg style hats, rather than fedoras. The fedora thing comes later, actually. And this parallels the falling out of fashion of Hamburg hats, by the way. Um, fedoras became more popular because fedoras came more in style. Um, in Riley Crabb's account that gives the rundown here, um, basically the men said that their people came from another world. They used the world, at least at first, they used the world planet when referring to Earth. They talked about their world, but then they would talk about your planet Earth. It's only later that they use the word planet to kind of talk about where they're from. And they talk to him about what they're doing on Earth, which is that they are harvesting something from our oceans, which was in short supply on their world. They were afraid that the efforts of the Bureau would expose them to the world, particularly given the nature of Bender's obsession with finding the answer to the flying saucer mystery. They make some mention of how powerful his attention is, how powerful his obsession is, and how that the power of that obsession alone um, actually constitutes a risk to them, which is interesting. Now, through the course of the, 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 the following months, um, they took him on little trips. They basically abducted him, first to a purported spaceship and then to an underground base that seemed to be on Earth. And later it was implied that the base was in Antarctica. Now, eventually Bender met a being who seemed to be a leader and who gave him more information about the world the aliens came from. On that world, all the beings are of one race, so there is little conflict. They believe in the great central source from which all things come and are only troubled when a periodic darkness covers their world and causes many to be taken away. Um, as you see here in part four, um, they refer to their existence as cold, loveless, and lightless. Um, 
that they eat a fungus. Um, it's it's kind of it's it's just kind of weird. Um, according to the aliens, there are three sexes on their world. This is what the leader uh, the, told him, who Crab refers to as Mephistopheles, which I think is hilarious. Um, according to the aliens, there are three sexes on their world which are necessary for full reproduction. The eggs which are produced by the females are taken and stored to hatch only after this great periodic darkness passes, whereby they can replenish their numbers. Apparently, when this darkness comes to them, a lot of them disappear. Now, at one point, Bender believed he was shown their true form, for they had told him that human, they take humans from time to time in order to disguise themselves. According to him, their true nature was hideous and reminded him of the Flatwoods monster, which, of course, was a well-known cryptid um, that was reported from 1952 and which had been investigated by Gray Barker, a Bureau member. So he was very familiar with um, what the Flatwoods monster was supposed to have looked at. Now, the beings enforced their hold over Bender through the use of what looked like a metal coin that suddenly appeared in a safe box in which Bender kept private materials. The coin would glow when they were near, and he could summon them by holding the coin and mentally requesting their presence. If Bender strayed from his promise to protect the secret of their presence, even in his own mind, you know, if he was tempted, he would be afflicted with sickening headaches that were completely debilitating. And in fact, they threatened him. They said that if he went ahead and did this, that terrible things would happen, including he might die. He tried several times to lose or misplace the coin, but it always reappeared back in, in its place. The men told him that when he noticed the coin had disappeared, that he could then tell his story because they would have completed their mission on our world and would be gone. So for a little while during these experiences with these guys, Bender continued on with the, um, with the Bureau as they investigated various UFO waves in the U.S., the U.K., and in Australia. And I mentioned it was also during this time that Betty, he met Betty, um, uh, who, who was with the U.K. Bureau, and they corresponded for a while, and eventually she came over, and eventually they would get married. Now, at some point in these exchanges, the men insisted that Bender close the Bureau because their work was endangering their secret. So Bender told his compatriots that that's what he was doing, that what's what he had to do, and they needed to announce this to the membership. And of course, as I mentioned, rumors ran riot, rampant. He was accused of stealing funds, which he had not done, um, he, of being more interested in his girlfriend and many more other things. Through it all, Bender maintained his silence, according to him in this account, uh, for about nine years until the coin disappeared and he could finally tell the whole story. Now, according to Bender, when he was finally able to tell his story, and he did, some of his last remaining, remaining friends from the Bureau days were so disgusted with him that they broke off all contact. And it's safe to say that many people didn't believe him. Gray Barker continued to refer to Bender's story in many subsequent writings and in the few public outings that Bender gave surrounding the book. Now, when Bender gave these, you know, when he did go out into public a few times in 1962 and provide information about his experiences, people were uh, Im suitably impressed with his demeanor and sincerity. Um, he certainly never varied in his story once he told it, and after that, those brief public um, experiences left the UFO field for good and for forever. So what is one to make of this tale? Riley Crabb regards it as a cautionary account of psychic attack and possession. He does admit that there are some psyops elements present in Bender's story, and actually when I reread it, I kind of noticed some of those. Um, and, and Crabb cites the Haynes Report uh, which some of you may know about, which was published uh, in both a, a, a heavily redacted, and it was published in a redacted, a popular, redacted, and unredacted version. Of course, we don't have access to the redacted version. Um, in 1997, you can still find 
the popular version online on the CIA website. Uh, and this is what's called the Haynes Report, which admits that intelligence services in the 50s were involved in hoaxing various elements of UFO experience and or story for a number of reasons. And of course, uh, that is something that, that John Keel and then later Jacques Vallée um, discussed and ver has, have discussed in various of their publications. And of course, this is the basis for the Men in Black comedy movies and for the character of the smoking man in the X-Files. So, um, you know, this idea that what happened to Bender is, is a story that he was told to tell uh, by CIA or intelligence operatives. Um, it's not that he exper it's not that they successfully um, were able to fool him, but that this was the story that they told him to tell based on some things that they revealed to him. Um, others have opined, of course, that Bender just got tired of having to deal with the complexities of his project, um, which had admittedly been quite successful and wanted to spend more time with his girlfriend, settle down, and just have a regular life. Um, Riley Crabb also spends some time talking about the very real possibility that other people have opined that um, given what Bender's other interests and proclivities were, that he was setting himself up for a psychic attack and that that's what happened, is that he was, he was attacked by various kinds of negative or demonic forces. Um, and in, in later years, uh, people like Rosemary Guiley uh, would, would speculate that perhaps this was an instance where the jinn um, exhibited themselves, especially um, given the nature of how hot his, his rooms would get when they were around, um, and the presence of that, that rotten egg smell or that sulfur smell that would often accompany their comings and goings. Um, uh, Riley Crabb also speculates that perhaps he had a series of really bad nightmares due to his obsessive nature and scared himself. Um, and once he started writing, how might he have been influenced by Barker's previous book about his own story? So there are things about this we don't know. Um, and I thought of that uh, more recently when I was reading the account of Sherwood, Sherwood's account of how he sort of unwittingly collaborated with Barker in producing writing uh, in order that he himself could become a writer, uh, that he, he sort of unwittingly and not entirely unwittingly col uh, collaborated with Barker um, in combining fiction and non-fictional elements for his own benefit. And you can, you can read this account here. It was something that was written for the Skeptical Inquirer um, in 1998 um, by John Sherwood. John Sherwood is a journalist, and he, this is his admission and account of how he, how he became a journalist and how Gray Barker helped him do this by helping him to falsify certain kinds of experiences and, and write about them. Um, and how Gray Barker had been doing this for years, and in particular with the Men in Black materials. It's not that it's not that everything that Gray Barker was fall, wrote about was false. It was that Gray Barker, for his own reasons, had very little difficulty sort of blending the two, uh, if it told a good story. So to me, it's really unclear. How ben, I don't think Bender was lying, but I think that there were, and I do think something happened to him. I think, I think there is an experience underneath his account because there are aspects of the account that are just too weird. And the fact is, is that he did just shudder everything and leave. And so I think something happened. But whether what he writes about happened specifically, that is much harder to tell, talk about. 
So this is probably this is a famous picture. I mean, there's a number of pictures of men in black um, that are out there, some of which I include on the original blog. And then there's this picture here. This is the picture of uh, the main dude in Antarctica uh, the, that uh, Riley Crabb describes as, as Mephistopheles, which I'm sure that some of you will get the, the cultural reference there, um, which I don't think is actually a fair characterization of, of this being or this entity um, and, and kind of displays Crabb's own own sense of things. But this is how this guy appeared to Bender, according to Bender. The, the appearance of the, the three men and this guy are a little bit different. The three men, uh, their skin wasn't as dark, but their eyes were like stars. And in fact, it was difficult for him to see uh, their faces because of how their eyes um, shown and sort of bored into him. This guy here, um, and this was the leader who gave him more of the history of the world that they were from, this guy here was more solid um, and he was darker. Uh, and, and it's important to note that this, he never refers to him as a black man. You know, he, it's, it's not that he, they, they look like you know, what in his, at during his time period would have been called colored people. He just has really dark skin that's kind of undefined and these, these eyes that will penetrate into you. Um, so this is the main dude in Antarctica. And this is the, who I refer to as the other main dude in West Virginia. Um, this is Gray Barker when he was kind of a young man and he's, Posing here with his book, They Knew Too Much About Flying Saucers, um, which, of course, again, was written before Bender actually told his whole story. So, as I said, given the time and effort that Bender put into the Bureau, it seems reasonable to conclude that something happened to him or that he had the experience of something happening to him. Now, whatever Bender's truth might have been, it is also true that even before Bender's description of them, perhaps bolstered by the tall tales perpetuated by Gray Barker, or, or not, the experience and appearance of men in black or strange dudes in these odd hats by individuals who actually don't know about Bender's three men is real and has been documented numerous times. In fact, that's the bulk of one of my previous blogs. And, and it is that which confused Scott Rogo, is that even though you have clear, clear chicanery going on with Gray Barker, um, and that this might confuse kind of like the social commentary or the social narrative about this, the fact is, is that there are people that have experiences with beings that appear this way who don't actually know this story or don't actually know anything about these books or Bender's specific experiences. And some of these are quite recent. And as many of you know, Nick Redfern has continued to collect these accounts and I have accounts of my own. And, and so on some level, whoever the three men are or the men in black are, or whatever this is, has continued to occur. So either Bender's aliens haven't left after all, or something else entirely is going on. And I genu generally kind of vote the latter, although both could be true in different ways. Um, now, when Men in Black attack is the last thing that was that uh, uh, Gray Barker published, uh, the last and I think it was published in the early 80s. I don't remember exactly, but I think it was in the early 80s. But it was then republished, I believe, in 2014, uh, maybe, yeah, 2014, maybe 2016, somewhere around in there. Now, that, that all seems like another decade ago, which I guess it was. Um, and in this particular edition that Andrew Colvin produces, he includes a number of other things in it. So you don't just have... 
um, Gray Barker's text. You also have the transcripts of, of, of interviews that Gray Barker gave um, uh, or, or took surrounding this as well as letters, correspondence, and a variety of other things. Um, so basically, Flying Saucers and the Three Men is really one of the strangest and most unsettling books I've ever read. Uh, not because I believe Bender unreservedly, which I do not, but because he had everything to lose and gained absolutely nothing by writing it. There are parts of it that have the air of authenticity in them. I don't know what else, to, how else to put it. So whether he's reporting exactly what happened to him or he couldn't report exactly what happened to him or exactly what he found out and is reporting what so, you know, something that he had to put together, that I don't know. So there is no way to tell whether it is literally true. And I think that when he wrote it, he knew that. People wouldn't believe him anyway. If nothing at, at all had happened, there would have been no reason for him to even write the book. He knew that and wrote it anyway, and he let it stand. And so it has stood. And this generator of a thousand stories is still with us today. So I would recommend that you get it, you read it, um, and make up your own mind about it. Um, it's a weird story. And it will remind you of many things, but the important thing to keep in mind is, is that it was published in 1962. So all the things that it reminds you of you're reminded because it was written that long ago and all of this stuff has become sort of present in our, uh, our cultural milieu, our cultural narratives about this stuff. So anyway, that is my blog for Mother's Day um, 2023, and I hope you're having a lovely time, whatever it is you're doing, and we'll catch you later.